So hi everyone and welcome to the three minute Jesus competition at IGARS 2022. We are very glad to have all of you here today. So a little bit background about the three minute Jesus. So it's also called 3MT and it's a research communication competition developed initially at the University of Queensland where students present their research topic in just three minutes with only one static slide and in an easy way so that everyone can understand it. So also non-specialist audience can, should get the message uh, behind the three minute thesis. And the first thing that I want to do today is to thank the amazing judging panelists we have today for the competition and who will select the three winners. We are very glad to have Dr. Kili Roth from Planet. Hi Kili, welcome to the three minute thesis competition. Thank you. And we're also happy to have Professor Avik Patasharya from the Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai. Hi, Avik. Hello, everyone. Wish you all the best. And uh, also Dr. Ronnie Hand from the German Aerospace Center, DLR. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, Farouche. Hi, everybody. All the best to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to support our finalists. And so the competition uh, you see here today have been advanced through a first round where the best 10 submitted presentation were selected and advanced to this final round. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the 10 of the final finalists we have for their hard work. So good job, everyone. So now- let me uh, tell you a little bit about the selection criteria for this round. So the first criteria we have is communication. So for example, did the speaker have sufficient state presence? And the second uh, criteria is comprehension. So where the, um, whether the speaker provided an understanding of the background so that also non-specialist audience can understand his talk. And the last criteria is engagement. So how well can the talk make you want to know more and whether you can feel the motivation behind the talk. So the three presentation will be selected by the evaluation committee, three best, and then uh, awarded with the IEEE GSS Excellence in Technical Communication Student Prize Award. And we have also this time another award. So the People Choice Award, and this is left to you as the audience to decide. So you can vote later after all presentations are over to your favorite finalists, but please only once. So in the chat box, I will send you an evaluation spreadsheet that you can use to um, give your score uh, to, the, to the, um, all the speakers, and then it can help you later to decide which one is your favorite. So, Today's agenda, we will start with the three empty presentations first. And in every slide, you will uh, see a three minute timer. So I will activate it once the uh, speaker will start talking. And please stay muted all, uh, during all the presentations. And then after all presentations are over, the uh, judging panelists will move to a private breakout room to discuss the results and select the winners. And we here, we will stay and we will start the people's choice voting and open the floor for the audience to ask questions to the finalists. So if you have any questions, please use the chat box to uh, submit them there and uh, also uh, write the name or the number of the finalists so that we know later to whom the question was. And then at the end, we will announce the winners. So, no, so now that you know all the rules, we can start. So our first finalist is Abhishek Ravindran from the Indian Institute of Information Technology, Design and Manufacturing, Kurnal, India. His talk is about active learning based semantic segmentation of minute objects from multispectral satellite images. Hi, Abhishek. Hi, hello. So Am I audible? First. Yeah, you can start yeah. whatever you want. Yes. Hello, everyone. So welcome to IGUS 2022. With context to my 3MT topic, let's get started. 
We'll start off with the introduction. What is semantic segmentation? With respect to image one, it's a set of group of pixels. So basically classifying the pixels into gray, orange, and blue is an example for semantic segmentation. Now, what is active learning? Let's take an example. Consider you are a professor at a college and you want to improvise and you want to improvise the whole, uh, you want to improvise the particular top uh, results with respect to the student scoring. So with respect to student A, we are able to see that the student A has performed really good. And with respect to student B, the student has not performed good. And hence iterative retraining or explicit training is required for student B rather than that of student A in order to perform well in the further particular exams or examinations. So this is the kind of similar kind of mechanism what active learning also uses. Hence, wherein this retraining or context to which we are focusing on is with respect to the weak learners in order to proceed further is what the agenda of active learning basically means to. And let's come down to the problem statement. Image three depicts the set of satellite images and image four is the semantic segmentation over the particular satellite images performed. So let's get back to image three, A and B. So in image three, we are able to see there are small objects and with image three B, there is a object, but we still find it difficult to visualize if there is an object or not. As a human itself, we are able to find it difficult to, to see if there is an object present or not. This is the exactly same problem, which even the deep learning model or machine learning model faces. Hence, to overcome this particular problem, we have proposed a solution wherein we are using the particular methodology, which is shown in the figure on the left-hand side, wherein I'll try to explain this into a simpler manner with taking an example. Consider we, have, we are having the optical problem, probably we are having vision problem, when, and we go visit a particular optician. The first thing what an optician does is he gives us a set of letters to read, and we see that we're not able to read out smaller or smaller letters. So what op the optician does it does is he incrementally or iteratively keeps changing the particular lenses such a way that we are able to visualize the particular objects in a clear sense. This implementation or this particular iteration is continued until unless we are able to visualize the particular object clearly. And we also notice that towards the total journey of uh, for, uh, for of, uh, incremental or uh, uh, iterative uh, process, the optician there is difference with respect to either of the eyes, which is uh, either of the of, of eyes, which he tends to uh, change. So basically what happens is with respect to the eye, which is lower of contrast. So the number of iterations performed over that eye would be more considering with respect to the uh, eye, which is on the other side or vice versa. So the spec, uh, the particular optician would suggest a particular uh, a set of spectacles, which is then used for uh, the visualizer to in, in order to read the particular images clearly, which is smaller. And this is the particular proposed solution in simpler terms. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Apu, sir. So now we have one minute for you to give your score. So we'll send you the spreadsheet now.
So I hope you uh, give your score already for Abhishek, and now we can move to the second finalist, which is uh, Gunjan Yoshi from the University of Tokyo, Japan. Uh, she's going to talk about multi-sensor data fusion using explainable neural networks. Gunjan, hello. Hello, Fairos. I'll start now. OK. Hmm. All of us use satellite data in our day-to-day -day lives. Many of the offline participants must have used Google Maps to find their way to KLCC. If you observe closely, you would notice that the quantity and the quality of the data has improved significantly over the past decade. The reason can be attributed to the increase in Earth observation sensors. Most of these sensors are available in wide range of spatial, spectral, and temporal resolutions. Many of these sensors have properties that are complementary to one another. Thus, it makes sense to use them together for observing the Earth's surface. Traditionally, we use optical satellites, which have a passive sensor. It means that the sensor takes photograph of the Earth in different wavelengths. These sensors, however, cannot work during night or even during cloudy weather. Synthetic aperture radar, SAR, on the other hand, is an active microwave sensor. This sensor produces its own energy and sends it back to the Earth. It then records the amount of energy that gets reflected back after interacting with the Earth's surface based on which interpretations are made. SAR has an all weather and an all day capability. In our work, first, we use these two sensors to map the damages of the 2018 Palu earthquake in Indonesia. We extract various relevant features from these sensors and feed them pixel by pixel to our proposed neural network. Our neural network estimates which land type each pixel belongs to. From the classification results, we can observe that the estimation accuracy increases when the data from two sensors are combined. Secondly, in our research, we attempt to build an explainable neural network. Neural networks are considered reliable methods across various applications. Their ability to learn and reproduce results on an unseen set of data is of interest to remote sensing community. But neural networks have a black box nature. This nature prevents their application in tasks that require transparency in decision making. We propose an inverse mapping method that can provide explanation to the decision of the neural network by paying attention to the backward signal flow. We observe that the inverse mapping has an ability to show us interesting, reasonable, and more importantly, explainable results. It shows us how different features collaborate while making predictions. Inverse mapping holds the potential to explain how a neural network thinks and arrives at judgment. Neural networks are said to replicate the human brain. Explainable neural networks can give us enriching insights into the brains that replicate our brains. Thank you. Thank you, Gonjan. That was perfect. So now we have one minute to give your score. Okay, so let's move to the third finalist. Uh, his name is Matrix Shah from Ahmedabad University in India. He's going to talk about surface reflectance retrieval of remote sensing images using deep learning. Hi, Matrix. Hello. Hello. So the floor is yours. Just start. Hello, hello. Am I? Yeah. 
we can hear yes. you okay hello the title of my thesis is surface reflectance retrieval for satellite images using deep learning the remote sensing images captured by satellite are influenced by atmospheric elements which changes the electromagnetic radiation which is reflected from the earth hence the energy received at the sensor is not exactly the same which is reflected from the earth the energy received at the sensor is called top of the atmosphere radiation and the energy reflected from the earth is called bottom of atmosphere or surface reflectance surface reflectance is the fraction of incoming sunlight that the surface reflects it is the most basic remotely sensed parameter and it is essential input to obtain many other parameters like vegetation indices leaf area index and many more atmospheric correction as you can see from the diagram a is it is the process which takes coa values as input it removes the effect of atmosphere and provides correct surface reflectance values as output there exists number of different approaches to atmospheric correction starting from basic image based approach to complex physics based approach however the problem with physics based approach is that they are complex at, and it involves very compute intensive calculations moreover physics based approaches are dependent on various hard to obtain atmospheric parameters like water vapor concentration and aerosol optical depth hence here we are providing a novel approach to solve the problem of atmospheric correction which uses deep learning model the deep learning models can be used to learn non linear spectral spatial relationship between the toa values and surface reflectance values uh, to prove our hypothesis we have done an initial experiment in which we have designed a simple encoder decoder type of architecture the data set we used was landsat 8 oli data set and the area of our study was amdavad city which is a flat region and gangtok city which is a hilly region of indian subcontinent the model evaluated based on the root mean root mean square error and the correlation of coefficient the low values of rms and high values of correlation of coefficient says that the model predicted values are very near to the reference values provided by lensat the advantages of using deep learning based model is that it is simpler intensive calculations and it does not require any information related to the atmosphere and apart from all these it provides accurate results the experiment which we performed was very basic very basic experiment uh, in future we are trying to incorporate spatial variation which covers all different land cover types that exist on the earth we are also trying to incorporate seasonal variation and temporal variation in the data set the deep learning model train with all such high uh, d all such data set will be very robust and probably in future it may replace the traditional physics based model to our knowledge this is the first of its kind of approach to solve the atmospheric correction which uses deep learning thank you thank you so much matric that was very interesting so we have one one minute break Okay, so now it's time to move to the next finalist. Jose Augustin, uh, Augustin Baratina from Central Sup Elec University of Paris, Calais from France. Uh, his talk is about complex valued neural networks for radar applications. Jose, hello. Hello, thank you for the introduction. 
But uh, the floor is yours. You can start whenever you want. <laughs> Thank you. Have you ever been amazed with AI? Well, I have. And the first encounter I had with it was in high school when I uploaded a picture to Facebook and I was amazed that not only recognized the faces on the picture I just uploaded, but could also tell me who they were. Now, of course, we can use this technique that at the time was pure magic to me in other fields, such as radar, for example, when we can use it to detect trees, urban areas, or any other target. But have you ever tried taking a picture at night? You'll be lucky if you see it blurry, if you see anything at all. And what about clouds? Optical images cannot go through clouds. Luckily, there are some other techniques, such as Pulsar, for example, which allows you to take uh, pictures in almost any weather condition, even at night or in cloudy days. Now, you probably know that if you take a picture with your phone camera, for, instance, for example, you have three channels, red, green, and blue. And these are real valued. However, these poster images are complex valued. And this magical Facebook algorithm I told you about can only deal with real values input. So what researchers or programmers normally do is they try to convert this complex value into real by using the amplitude value or using some other transformation technique. But what if instead of adapting the data to the algorithm, we adapted the algorithm to the data? Indeed, we can use complex valued neural networks. And here's what the fun part of my thesis began, the fighting. So on one side, we have the well-known and conventional real value neural network. And on the other side, we have the new complex value neural network. They'll be fighting against each other to see who can better classify or segmentate different pulsar images. Now, so far, we've tried this fighting in many flavors such as different data sets, different input representations, or different model architectures. And spoiler alert, it was in all of them that complex value neural networks came victorious. Now, I know I already ruined the ending for you, but if you're still interested in this fighting, please uh, go check my work on the topic. And always remember that simple is good, but complex is better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. So now we have one minute to give your score. And I want to um, take the opportunity to tell the audience. So, so the, strip, uh, the spreadsheet that I sent you, so you can download it and then edit it locally on your laptop. So. You cannot edit it online, so it's not for for editing online. So just download it, and then you can open an Excel uh, file and then give your score. Okay, so now we can move to the next finalist. Who is Rajat Shinde from Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, India. And his TMT title is Why Scan More? Hi, Rajat. Hi, Ferus. Hello, everyone. So the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. We all like clicking pictures. And just after the last talk was all about pictures, 
So I would like to tell you that we like to click pictures, share, with our, share it with our friend and even post it on online social media. But do you all know that our natural eyes are accustomed to view in 3D? Our 3D surroundings comprises of two dimensions, which is the floor on which we walk or the chairs on which we sit or the table on which we keep our uh, systems. Even the screen on which you are looking at currently is two dimensional in nature. So from where does the third dimension come into picture? The third dimension comes into picture from the distance from the 2D plane, which is elevation, height, or even depth. In Earth observation, while observing Earth, LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging, is such a data set which can provide you very accurate three-dimensional measurements. So every point in that LIDAR scan is having X, Y, and Z information associated with it. In India, the terrestrial LIDAR surveys have been made mandatory for road construction activities, whereas in Japan, LIDAR has been used prominently in agricultural robots for precision farming and agriculture activities agricultural activities. So LIDAR is taking uh, a huge market gap and it is uh, getting into wide attention for many, many research activities and even in terms of capital, as you can see in the left side of the screen, that LIDAR market is expected to reach $2.8 billion by 2025. We even joke that it is even more than many of the good mutual funds, uh, giving a, a growth return of 20%. Jokes apart, but if you will see on the bottom left part, LIDAR scene is typically very dense in nature, which creates a challenge of processing it. So processing implies a human eye can try to visualize the LIDAR scene, detect objects from it, but it becomes very difficult for a computer. So here comes my research, which is neural sparse modeling process, where I, try, uh, where I have developed a deep learning based model for generating sparse representations from a LIDAR point cloud. These sparse representations are few measurements from the entire LIDAR scene, which typically comprises of million of points. And then we reconstruct the entire scene based on some mathematical conditions. This approach finds huge impact and huge potential in applications involving rapid disaster assessment and uh, even in forestry and urban environments. In my research, I have done two case studies for forest and results, uh, forest and urban environment. And as you can see, we were able to reconstruct the entire LIDAR scene of million points just from 4% of the measurements. So this result is, uh, seems very fruitful in, uh, in scanning uh, urban environments. So ladies and gentlemen, next time when you go out for scanning environment, why scan more? Only scan which is required. Thank you. Thanks, Rajat, for your great talk. Thank you so much. So now we have one minute break, then we can continue. So the next talk will be given by Ismail Abiola Olani from Purdue University in the US. His talk is about developing a UAS data hub for the wheat coordinated agricultural projects. Hello, Ismail. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, just start whenever you want. Okay, uh, the title of my presentation is developing a U.S. data hub for wheat coordinated agriculture projects. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, the United States is ranked among the top five largest wheat producing countries in the world. In order to maintain its competitiveness in the global market, the USDA saw the need to increase the productivity of U.S. wheat crop varieties. 
To do this, there is a need for various kinds of data, including the plant's physical characteristics, location-based data sets, plant genetics, etc. This data will help farmers and scientists make decisions on variety of wheat that performs best in a specific location and under specific conditions. Growing this variety of wheat would therefore lead to better crop productivity. In this research, we are developing a US data hub, which is an online platform for processing, analyzing, and visualizing US data for wheat cap. To do this, we are collecting data sets across various fields within the country using drones equipped with sensors that would help capture high resolution data about the wheat crop. We have developed automated workflows in form of algorithms to process this data to obtain information such as the plant height, canopy cover, canopy volume, and vegetation indices such as NDVI and NDRE. This information in conjunction with phenomics and genomic data from our collaborators who are plant uh, scientists would be incorporated into this centralized data hub that is the US data hub. In essence, our data hub would provide information such as growth performance, plant traits, gene variation, et cetera, about a particular field in the green season. So far, we have collected data across four regions within the country. As shown in the leftmost part of my slide, you can see uh, areas such as California, Texas, and Kansas. Uh, we are confident that this project would provide uh, US wheat growers easy access to data that will help them produce better crops which would in turn increase wheat productivity across the United States. In conclusion, to maintain the competitiveness of US wheat crop growers in the global market, this data hub has been developed as an online platform to process, analyze, and visualize US data. This will serve as a powerhouse that would provide US wheat growers easy access to data that will help them make proper decisions in order to produce better crops and also increase productivity. And don't forget that better access to data reads better uh, research. This in turn goes to more yield and gives uh, more food for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ismail, for your great talk. So now it's time to give your score for Ismail. Have one minute. Okay, the next talk will be given by Kushike Shaparia from the Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai. And she's going to talk about identifying objects from space. So Kushike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kayo. Hello, everyone. I assume everyone uh, over here will be having a smartphone with a camera on it, which can detect images Okay, I'm so sorry. I think I am stuck. Uh, okay. Hello, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm, I think I was stuck somewhere. So, yeah. Uh, because I cannot see my video. Uh, I think we cannot see your video as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm so sorry for this. It's okay. Can I start all over again? Yeah, so... I'm so sorry for this. Yeah, I resisted your, your timer. <laughs> so is your video not working? Yeah, 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 I think, yeah. So can I start? 
yeah, yeah, you can start whenever you want. Hello, everyone. I assume everyone in this room will be having a smartphone with a camera on it, which can click pictures. But what if I'll ask you to change the angle of your camera? Now imagine your camera is hanging above your head and taking pictures. So the overhead perspective of the camera taking the pictures will be changed, right? Now, if we have to increase the area to be captured by hundreds of kilometers, the object in that area will be very small in a large scale image. So what if, if we need to detect objects on that large scale image with the overhead perspective and along with that, we need to identify objects belonging to same category. For example, to identify objects like fighter planes or different kinds of planes such as Rafal or Siroi, which is having similar identical structures from along with that different species of crops and vegetation. So the big question is, is it possible? Yes, this is where my research work comes in. In remote sensing, satellite images with different sensors are able to detect objects using spatial features such as texture, shape, and size, along with that spectral features such as composition of material reflected from the wavelength. Hyperspectral sensor is one such imaging technique which uses wide range of spectrum, which just not only uses a wide range of spectrum instead of providing or assigning just primary color to the images like RGB. In addition to that, Presently, hyperspectral images are able to classify the images at pixel level, while the detections of images are confined with multispectral data. So, in my research work, we are focusing on object level detection and feature extraction using three dimensional convolution neural network to automate the feature extraction and object detection using both spectral and spatial information along with that where two dimension of spectral information and one dimension to what two dimension of spe spectral information and one dimension of spatial information is used along with that my research work is not just confined with the detection of urban features forest classification or species it can also help in achieving sustainable urban management forest classification and even food security all over the globe Thank you. Thank you so much, Koshiki, for the great talk. So we have some time for judging. So the next talk will be given by Barbita Shatterji from Sikkim Manipal University in India. She's going to talk about estimation of ionospheric total electron content using GPS signals and its characterizations. Hello, Barbita. How are you? Hello. Hi. So the floor is yours. You can start whenever you want. Today, I'm going to present my work on estimation ionospheric total electron content using GPS signals and its characterization. The ionosphere is a charged region of the upper atmosphere, and it has a changing refractive index when any electromagnetic wave passes through it. 
So uh, the GPS signals which we use in our daily life being electromagnetic waves in nature suffer long range delays while passing through the ionosphere. But these range delays need the proper removal Otherwise, it proves to be critical when we use it in case of the satellite navigation or radar imaging purposes. So one very important parameter of the ionosphere that helps in removing this range delays is the total electron content value of the ionosphere, since it's directly proportional to the range delays and inversely proportional to the square of the frequency of the signal that is passing through the ionosphere. So my work has basically three objectives, that is determining the TC values and the variations of the TC values that occur under different conditions. So under the first condition, I went into studying the TC value variations for an entire day along with time and uh, at two, uh, the day to day TC value variations for two different days. Okay, so this blue and magenta curves for the first graph shows that there is a difference in the TC values for two different days. Right, and they were quite this. So in the next part, I moved into studying the uh, disturbed day compared to that on a normal day, the TC value variations. For the disturbed day, I took up a stormy day, the geomagnetic storm case, the St. Patrick's Day storm. And on that day, the Earth's geomagnetic field was severely affected by a magnetic storm from outside. And that resulted in uh, severe atmospheric irregularities. Uh, so I have used the irregularity index ROTI, the lower one graph, and that depicts that atmosphere exhibited two extreme irregular conditions when the storm hit the earth. So there was a lot of TC value variations on that day. In the last and final graph, I went into observing TC value variations on a solar eclipse day compared to that on a solar normal day. So from the graph itself, I think it's clearly visible the TC variations on eclipse day was much lower compared to that on a solar normal day. That is on the immediate next day I took for the graph. So that implies that TC value variations has a direct influence on the solar flux. So um, this was a very short work that I have worked and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Pavita, for your nice talk. So now we can have one minute for you to give your score. So the next 3MT talk will be given by Stefano Principe from the University of Sanio in Italy. He's uh, going to talk about SAR processing applied to GNSS reflectometry. Hi, Stefano. Yes, hello, thank you. So you can start whenever you want. Okay, thanks. Um, hello, my research um, topic. Uh, is global navigation satellite systems reflectometry, also known as uh, GNSSR. GNSSR is a, a remote sensing technique in which GNSS satellites are used as uh, transmitters of opportunity, uh, while the receiver is a passive sensor, um, which can be positioned over a, a fixed air more space bone platform. Uh, the receiver is able to collect the GNSS signals scattered off a geophysical surface, um, uh, such as the ocean or land or uh, sea ice. And after a proper processing, it is possible to retrieve some important uh, parameters, for example, uh, soil moisture, sea ice thickness and extension, or wind speed. Genesis R is a, um, a simple, uh, cheap, and, and uh, effective remote sensing technique, but um, it has two important limitations. First of all, a low signal to noise ratio, and the second, relatively coarse ground spatial resolutions. 
these problems essentially depend on the structure of the Genesis waveform, which was not uh, thought for uh, remote sensing applications in the first place, but only for navigation purposes. So in my um, PhD work, uh, I propose um, a synthetic aperture radar processing applied to Genesis R signals. Um, I developed a model and after um, simulations carried out in a spaceborne scenario, uh, I obtained two important results. First of all, as one can see in the um, um, bottom left figure of the slide, uh, through uh, a sar like processing, um, it is possible to obtain an increase in the, um, uh, in the ground spatial resolution, in particular, uh, the resolution cell with the SAR processing can be five, uh, four times smaller with respect to uh, conventional processing. And the second important result is that through uh, a SAR-like processing, it is also possible to uh, increase the signal to noise ratio up to 17 dB with respect to conventional processing. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Stefano, for your nice talk. So we have one minute now. So our final finalist for today is Subhadi Boral from the Indian Statistical Institute. And his 3MT talk is titled, What is Normal? Hi, Subhadi. Hello. So the floor is yours. Good day, everyone. First, I want to thank IGERS for this opportunity and for my selection in the top 10. Now, I will request all of you to think about 2018. In 2018, if you would have seen someone wearing a mask, you will ask why you are wearing a mask? Because not wearing a mask was normal then. Now, currently standing in 2022, if you see someone not wearing a mask, you will ask why you are not wearing a mask? Because now wearing a mask has become normal. So normal has changed. In the field of machine learning, we try to learn, understand what is real life through data. In my research, I am developing an unsupervised model that will detect what is normal with adaptation. That means with new reality, it will not stick to old concepts, but it will detect what is new normal. And with respect to that, what is abnormal or anomalous will be get detected. Now, when a situation comes over and over again, the data that represents that particular situation also appears frequently. And using that, my model sends that as normal. So this is very basic but strong intuition. So as an application, I monitor traffic movement of a city through sensors. So suppose my model is uh, monitoring a particular area and sense that that particular area around the weekdays from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. is having high traffic. So due to that, the situation of high traffic for that particular time will be sensed as normal. Now, it may happen that after six months, my model start observing that this area is facing less traffic compared to the 
previous one and if that situation continues of lesser traffic that means that sen the sensor data associated with that situation also occurs frequently so my model will sense that this low traffic for that particular time will be the new normal and high traffic for that particular time will be again became abnormal so that is how my model will detect what is normal depending on the current situation so now you can see the normal has again changed someone is using mask someone is not thank you thank you so pati for your great talk so now we have one minute to give your score and then we finish it all the three empty presentations So now that all the presentations are over, we are ready to start the process of voting for the people choice winner. And um, in the meantime, the judging panelists will move to a private breakout room to discuss the result. So we um, send you to a breakout room. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think the judging panelists are now on the private room. And so the vote is open now. So you can uh, either scan the QR code with the, your phone or just I will uh, post the link in the chat. So just one minute. And if anyone has a question to any finalist, please use the chat box to, to post your question or unmute yourself and ask directly.
Okay, I see some people started to vote. It's good. So no one from the audience has a question. So it's your chance now to, to ask questions. Uh, I have a question for Jose. Mm -hmm. Jose, uh, it was a very interesting work when you were mentioning about complex neural network. So I was Thank just you. trying to understand, yeah, I was just trying to understand what exactly uh, the complex neural network is. So do we use it in complex space or uh, the matrices yeah. that are used are complex numbers? Yeah, so, so well, thank you for the question. Uh, by the way, I'm doing the talk, uh, my virtual presentation tomorrow. So if you want more details, okay. you can come. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so ba basically, when, when we do a neural network, uh, I don't know if you use, use TensorFlow, for instance, um, yes. you, you create your dense layer, for example, and then yes. all the multiplications and addition are done in the real real space. And mm -hmm. if you try to input, because it exists, complex um, tensors, it will throw an error saying you cannot do that. So okay. basically, now the, the weights that you have to learn, the, 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 the learning parameters are complex valued. The input mm -hmm. is complex valued, and then the operations are very similar because it's multiplication, addition. So in the end, it's the same operations, but in the complex space. Okay. Um, so basically, that's it. So it's the, the same math. It's all defined, but in complex. Okay. So would the output be also having the imaginary part? The what part, sorry? So you said the input and the uh, algorithm would be having working on complex numbers. So the output yeah. which would be generated that would also be having complex numbers. So, so for the output, that, that's actually a good question because um, because indeed when you when you have a classes, let's say I have a forest exactly. or urban areas, what is complex there? Like I mean, it's forest, it's one or zero, right? Yeah. But um, so so you have uh, different options there. Um, the easiest option is to apply uh, an output um, activation function that takes mm -hmm. complex input, but outputs um, real output. Like uh, for instance, you do an average of the results. You do softmax to real part, softmax to complex part, and then do an average, for example. That, that's an option. Another option is to use, uh, it's used in, an, in a paper of uh, one, um, one guy named Kao, who actually takes um, uh, a loss function that is defined for complex valued. So, so it's already a thing because you can not minimize complex value, like you cannot compare these values minimum is lower than this, but well, he defined a, a loss function to do that. So that's are some options that you can do. That's, that's interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up for Jose? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I, again, very interesting presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I'm very happy to accept that uh, complex valued neural networks uh, perform better than real valued neural networks in, in, in your experience, but can you give me a like very quick explanation to why that's true? Well, the, the, the why part is it's, it's, hard actually to answer. I, I, I cannot say for certain, for instance, I, I have theory of what it happens. Um, my work actually started, so, so first there's a, there are people who work uh, on this before me, right? Even one of the, the juries here uh, wrote a paper, uh, Ronnie uh, of uh, 
complex value the multi-layer perception but uh, the, there's someone called Akira Hiros, which I think is in this EGAS conference, who wrote a book of complex learning network, and he has a chapter explaining in his, uh, why, why he thinks it works better. Uh, uh, something I did on that, uh, on that path is that, um, well, uh, before starting to the Pulsar and radar application. I did some kind of toy example, where I where I generated the uh, data, and this data had as I it was randomly generated. I generated having the the um, circularity uh, aspect in in mind. You know, like complex uh, uh, random um, variables can have something a property called circularity. That it's more or less like a relationship between the imaginary and the real part. And of course, when you use real value, the multi-layer perception, for example, what you can you do is you stack um, the real part and the imaginary part, you know, like a vector of twice the size. But you can never tell that this uh, complex, this real value is related to this imaginary value. Is the real uh, network who must know that, must learn that. So you are maybe giving it uh, more local minimums, um, whereas the complex has already like like uh, that already solved. Like you're telling, okay, this is the real part, the imaginary part. They go together. So that may be one explanation. And indeed, um, uh, pulsar data. There are some papers that uh, referred for them to have some kind of um, circularity uh, aspect. So it can be an explanation of why it happens, but I don't have the solution to be honest. I tried, it works, and I'm happy with that. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, I hope it was clear. Uh, I feel like I over-explained kind of. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it was a very interesting explanation. So, uh, Peru's is the question. I think I'm still on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I had one question for Gunjan as well. I think she mentioned something about inverse mapping in her work. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Gunjan. So, I work on a similar kind of problem where it is not exactly inverse mapping, but it is, uh, you can say, uh, inverse problem, inverse uh, optimization uh, solving problem of the convex optimization problem. So I use uh, this compressive sensing based algorithms for that. So what exactly are you using in your work? Okay, so we basically use a fully connected neural network and mm -hmm. we have our own activation. We, we propose our own activation function. Uh, okay. So once the classification is done, what we do is we take the uh, winner neuron for each pixel and propagate the signal backwards. And in, uh, when we propagate the signal backwards at the uh, output terminal of the inverse, which if you, yeah, so the output terminal of the inverse would have a, a correlation, uh, would show us some values from which we can correlate the output and the input. Okay, okay. So I think and the solution would be in the weights. Sorry? Yeah, so what you are trying to optimize is the weights of the network and you have input and output. So the mapping would be, uh, yeah, the mapping would be learned based on this. Yes, exactly. I'll be presenting my, uh, a poster on my work on Thursday. And okay, uh, that's it. Oh, bye. Thank you. So all the best to all of you who are presenting their work. Okay, I hope everyone uh, voted for his favorite finalist.
So we will close the voting system soon. So if you didn't vote yet, please do it now. So if there are no questions left, we can have maybe a two minutes break and then we come back, just grab some drinks or we can wait for the judges. Oh, Perus, if I may ask, what do you work on? Uh, if you just wish to share, it, if it's all right. Yeah, yeah, please. please. What was your question? Uh, so, what do you work on? What is your uh, specialization? And okay. Oh, um, what I'm working on. So, I'm uh, specialized in SAR, so scientific aperture radar design and concepts. So not with uh, data processing, but more on the design of the SAR system. So okay. informing, digital beamforming, antennas design and so on. So the instrumentation. Oh, okay. So I think the judges are back. We are back. Okay. <laughs> I come back. Hmm.
so before announcing the results so if one of the judges have uh, has some questions you can ask the finalists so until we announce the result so so let me stop here. you know ismail it's very easy uh, first, second, and third will be announced now, and everybody else is fourth place. <laughs> That's good, yeah. So now uh, I will give the floor to uh, Kili from the evaluation committee to announce the winners. And so it's my great pleasure to announce our top three for uh, the Igers 2022 three minute thesis competition. Third place is going to Rajat Chind. Why scan more? We agree with you. Let's not scan more. Let's keep scanning a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Roth. And thank you, Aljadis. Nice. Congratulations. So, second place goes to Ismail. You did very well, it turns out. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank we you. were very impressed by the system and the important problem that your research is taking on. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. And in first place, we have Gunjin Yoshi, uh, multi-sensor data fusion with explainable neural networks. It's always exciting to see where people are pushing the boundaries in neural nets. And I think explainable neural networks are something that are really helping us understand how to better use data. Uh, you had a fantastic technical explanation and congratulations on winning first place in this year's competition. Thank you so much, Kelly. Congratulations. And now um, I will announce the uh, People's Choice winner. So it's Kushki Shaparya with the title Identifying Objects from Space. Congratulations, Kushki. So you got the highest score. So here's the final voting. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you. So I want to thank all of the finalists and also, yeah, especially the judging uh, committee for their time and their commitment. And thank you for joining us today. So it was really a very interesting three-minute 